And I welcome you um, to this uh, Social Sciences Forum with Nate Silver. Um, and uh, we all appreciate your patience um, and look forward to the talk. Um, Nate Silver, um, a 2000 graduate, University of Chicago in economics, has in fact spent uh, the great majority of his professional career um, studying two of America's favorite pastimes, baseball and politics. Uh, he gained his first um, real reputation um, as a baseball statistical analyst with a program called PACOTA, um, which stands for Player Empirical Comparison and Optimization Test, which may also give some clue as to how he analyzes politics <laughs> uh, as well as baseball. Uh, but as an early reader myself of the Bill James Baseball Abstract, uh, which those of you who either read or saw Moneyball uh, might know about, um, I'm impressed uh, by Mr. Silver's uh, analysis of baseball. More recently, however, he's been doing politics. He began as a blogger on the Daily Coast, um, and then in 2008, uh, opened his own um, a website, 538.com, 538 being the number of electors in the Electoral College. Um, as a political historian, uh, one who has done with about 1 50th of the expertise of Mr. Silver um, in analyzing voting patterns, um, I've been a virtual groupie um, of 538 um, ever since 2008. Um, I watched it avidly uh, during that um, election. Um, and like others, was both um, impressed and in some ways reassured um, that, Nate's act, that Nate's projections are so accurate, uh, carrying 49 of the 50 states he got right, within about a percentage point, I think, of the overall popular vote, uh, accurately predicting all 35 uh, senatorial um, elections. It was a remarkable uh, performance, which won him a good deal um, of national uh, publicity. Uh, and then in 2010, uh, 538.com was um, absorbed into, I suppose, the New York Times, where we can now find it um, online at the New York Times at 538. Uh, he had a nice record as well in looking at uh, the 2010 election, uh, and on occasion he continues to do baseball and soccer uh, and other sports as well, with the same kind of statistical um, expertise. It's a real pleasure uh, to have Nate Silver here today, um, and I look forward to, as you all do, to talking about politics, uh, 2012 and the rest of it. So, hey. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for uh, for having me. We had a couple of logistical hiccups. I actually got on the wrong train this this morning. Uh, I mean, I kind of had a good excuse. They were like right on the same aisle, and so the one went to Boston and not to Baltimore. And I was on the Boston one until I got to Fairly Good and figure it out, or, or was told actually by the Amtrak ticket representative in a friendly way. Uh, but anyway, and we also have a presentation that we can't figure out how to get to work, but Malcolm Gladwell never uses PowerPoints for his presentation, so I hope this will elevate the discourse somewhat. Um, but I'm here to talk about looking ahead to, uh, to November basically at this point, in case you didn't know, Rick Santorum dropped out, making kind of obvious what everyone else had known for three weeks, that Mitt Romney would be the Republican nominee, so it's going to be Romney versus Obama. Obama, by the way, mathematically clinched, not that there was much doubt, but mathematically clinched the nomination, the Democratic nomination after uh, after last week. So uh, so there's not any real doubt about what the matchup will be, and so I want to take a look at kind of what we can look at now, uh, what we can look at now in terms of predicting or forecasting what the outcomes might be. Um, by the time we get to October or, or November, certainly, um, you're most going to want to look at, at just the head-to-head -head polls. Um, sometimes people don't realize how reliable it has become late in the election. If you looked at the McLaughlin group, for instance, and what they said on the evening before, not the evening before, the weekend before the 2008 election. At this point, Obama was up seven points nationally. He was up in Ohio and Florida and Michigan and Colorado and et cetera, et cetera, right? Very clear he was going to win unless there was some kind of massive, you know, November surprise or racial backlash or something, right? Um, but, you know, they actually said they were, it was too close to call. Monica Crowley of Fox News actually said that John McCain would win by half a point. Uh, and, you know, so that kind of punditry is something we hope to improve upon uh, for my book, which I'll kind of weave in here periodically. I have a book coming out in September. It's called The Signal and the Noise. And it's all about 
forecasting, and I've been in fields where, I mean, in baseball you have so much <coughs> data to work with uh, that you kind of can't really go right. You can always make, always make progress and always find different relationships that are statistically significant and that hold up pretty well. Um, you know, that's a little bit more dangerous in politics potentially, and so people get fooled. Also in politics, uh, unless you're actually running for office, there's not the same incentives to make good, <laughs> make good predictions and actually, um, actually do good analysis as there is in, in baseball. And baseball hates winning and losing ball games, and that tends to make people more disciplined in the end toward, hey, you know, once teams saw that the Red Sox and the Oakland A's and the, and the Tampa Bay Rays were having success with more numerically different approaches, then that kind of people are like, well, you know, we'd like to, we'd like to win ball games, so we'll hire like a nerd from MIT who costs forty thousand dollars a year instead of the bad starting pitcher who costs four million dollars a year, and it kind of worked out pretty well. But in politics, a lot of people really just want partisan spin. They want, uh, and you, you know, frankly, you realize this a little bit more now working in in a newsroom like I do in the New York Times, what the imperatives of news coverage are, where there are incentives to make the, the race seem closer than it really might be. Um, there are incentives to, you know, kind of let each campaign have its voice and when they don't really have a plausible argument for why they're, why they're gonna win. And so the, the, the benchmark for political coverage is, is pretty low. Um, I also wanna emphasize though that uh, <coughs> there's no kind of holy grail Really, and the other thing I found in this book is it's not just kind of the pundits and the self proclaimed experts who do badly, but also a lot of very sophisticated and smart people. I just finished a chapter, a rising chapter on earthquake forecasting, for instance, which is something where we've made no progress as a society for literally millennium. You know, we, I mean, we know that there's going to be more risk of an earthquake in in uh, in California than in New Jersey. Although, hey, we had an earthquake not far from here last year. Uh, but in terms of when they might come, people thought that the region in Japan where we had magnitude 9.1 last year was actually uh, a low risk area, which was not low risk area, but they thought that, well, you'll have magnitude sevens, maybe magnitude eight, but not a magnitude nine, which was kind of a silly conclusion. They said, well, look at the other magnitude nines and you know, they all come in areas that have different sea floors than this one does, right? Um, but there have only been five magnitude nine earthquakes in the history of recorded <laughs> Civilization. We didn't really have enough data to make generalizations about magnitude nine <coughs> earthquakes, and so that area was less prepared than it might have been. The Fukushima plant was prepared for an 8.6 and not a, not a 9.1. Um, if you had looked at a simple statistical relationship called the Gutenberg Richter law, which basically says that for every 10 magnitude seven earthquakes, you have one magnitude eight. For every 10 magnitude eight, you have one magnitude nine, etc. It would have predicted that there's a, a possibility of earthquake in that region. Not a strong possibility, thankfully, but you know, a once per 300 year event and people might have been more prepared for how they design things. But um, people want to uh, think they can predict everything when really often it's stepping back and saying, let's look at the big picture here, let's say what we can say, what we can't say. Um, this comes up in election forecasting as well because we don't have that much data really on presidential elections since World War II, which is when you get good economic statistics, when the Democratic and Republican parties became pretty close to what they are now, oriented around New Deal politics. There have only been 16 elections since then, so we can make some broad generalizations. For example, having a good economy probably helps the incumbent party, um, but it's not deterministic. And you'll see sometimes analyses that will say, well, if Obama gets, you know, he'll for sure win if he gets over this number, or for sure lose if he gets under this number of jobs and so forth, right? Really what it means is that the current actually works out to be about 150,000 jobs per month. Um, if we create 180,000 jobs per month, that might mean the odds are kind of 60-40 in his favor and 40-60 against him if we don't. But there are a lot of other factors that go into voting. Um, one big debate is how much do, do candidates matter, for instance. But we can you know, step back and look at, look at some basics, at least. Um, one of those is, at this point, how reliable are our polls? We know they're reliable in October or November, but what about now? So I have a list here, which I will read to you, I guess, about uh, what the polls said in previous elections, head-to-head -head polls in April uh, of, of previous year. So in April 2008, Obama had 45% in the polls, McCain had 44%. So we kind of got the winner right, but it looked like it'd be a closer election than it turned out to be. 2004, the polls were pretty good. They had Bush ahead by about a point. Um, 1996, they had Clinton ahead by 16 points over Bob Dole. But you see some, some screw-ups if you go further down the list. In 1988, Michael Dukakis was ahead of George Bush 
in the polls by about five points in 1992. Uh, Bush 42, Clinton 32, Perot 22. You kind of have to reverse Clinton and Bush there. Um, in 1980, uh, Reagan was three points behind Jimmy Carter in the average of polls. So, you know, they do a, a they have not <coughs> very much informational content at this point. The candidates might not be all that well known. Uh, what you might want to look at more is kind of to, to break things down into different components to look at those individually. So one of those is the incumbent president. Um, historically, the cutoff for where you're at in terms of winning and losing election on election day for your approval rating is about, is about 48%. Um, Bush won in 2004 with a 48% approval rating. He had one or two points to spare against John Kerry, well, not earned very much today in Ohio, which was a decisive state. Uh, so, you know, somewhere in the high, mid to high 40s is where you go from being a favorite to winning re-election to being an underdog, um, which is basically where, right, where Obama is, is right now. He's at about 48, 49% in most polls. We also know that when it comes to November, about 90% of people who approve of the president will vote for him, and about 90% of people who disapprove will not vote for him. It's the most basic, um, basic metric. A few months ago, Obama would have lost that race, where his disapproval rating exceeded his approval rating by, by a few points. Um, now I feel that that's clear. He seems to have gotten some boost from the economy. I think, frankly, he's gotten some boost from staying out of the news <laughs> a little bit. I mean, basically, Obama's approval rating for the past two years, really, um, has settled around 47, 48 percent, a little higher when you have an event like killing Osama bin Laden, uh, a little bit lower when you have a political disaster like the debt ceiling debate. Um, but it's been remarkably steady and stable over time. Sometimes you'll see an approval rating poll come out and people will will debate the nuances of, oh, why is he at 46% instead of 50% or vice versa? It, you know, it doesn't really matter that much in the end. It suggests that we're in a very a very close election right now. If you held it against an average Republican opponent today, then it'd be kind of a toss up. So there, there are basically two main questions to think about going forward until November. Um, one of them is, is Mitt Romney an above average candidate, a below average candidate, or kind of just a standard issue Republican candidate? Um, and that's a trick question to answer. One thing about variables related to candidates and campaigns is that they're harder to quantify. Sometimes that makes people, um, well, sometimes that makes the media pay too much attention to them, right? It's all about, oh, we're kind of adding value, but it can also make scholars and so forth and stat people like me dismiss those out of hand, maybe more than we should. Um, one thing that's fairly clear is that when you have a candidate who's very far from the ideological mainstream, meaning like a a McGovern or a Barry Goldwater, that, that the party pays a penalty relative to the president's approval ratings, relative to the economy, other things that, that we know or like pretty well with elections, we know there's some additional punishment. Likewise, uh, being a centrist can help you to some extent. Not like kind of a necessarily like a DC beltway kind of John Huntsman centrist, although in theory it would, but usually they don't get through the primaries. But if you have if you're someone like a Bill Clinton who can appeal more to to Mara voters and break from the party a little bit. You know, I mean frankly even 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 John McCain had a little bit of that <laughs> in two thousand eight. If you go back and watch the, the debates from two thousand eight, it's um, it wasn't thought of this way at the time, but it's kind of surprising how um, how civil the conversation was compared to what we're very likely to experience from both sides this year. Um, where he knew that Bush was very unpopular, he knew the GOP was very unpopular, he knew he had to break away from it, and then the economy got even worse, and the kind of Palin thing didn't really work out very well exactly, so he probably didn't have a chance uh, beyond a certain point. But, you know, hey, you know, you, you could imagine him losing by, by 15 points, given how much things were we're falling apart. But usually when you see when you see upsets with candidate, who at least from the start, I mean Bush in two thousand, he's not thought of as being a moderate today, but he had to overcome some doubts from GOP primary voters that he was too much of a moderate. Um, you know, Romney starts in a somewhat parallel position in some ways. Um, what's different though is that the Republican Party has moved to the right, they've become more conservative, both the voters and the party elite. And so you have Romney, who's kind of this uh, this guy who has a very uh, very moderate record in Massachusetts, uh, but has been running very far to the right now. And yeah, I guess now it's the etch a sketch thing, but you have to, now it's gonna shake it up and see where he ends up. Uh, but certainly there's a plan B that the White House might have in this election, which is that you can maybe try and make it more of a battle of 
ideas in the battle of you know being forward looking. The White House might like that better, um, even a personality contest might like better than having a referendum on on Obama because the economy is still getting better, but still not all that good. Um, you have the health care bill, which are unpopular. So uh, you know once once your approval rating is at fifty percent, not forty eight percent, then you kind of you're going to win the referendum. Remember, when you're at 50%, that means probably you have some undecideds, and it means so you probably like 50 approve, 43 disapprove, and then 7% undecided to probably win that election. But he's not quite there yet. So it might be more of a nasty kind of 2004 style campaign, and it might be the White House's preference, uh, frankly. Um, the other question is, if you look at Romney's favorability ratings, there was some question in ABC News poll, kind of the, you know, who would you have a beer with? Question. I'm not really sure if those questions have any predictive power or not, uh, but you do have Romney going in um, to the to the general election phase with with pretty much the lowest favorability ratings we've seen for for a, a nominee and other ticket in a long in a long time, really since about 1976 when people started asking those questions. Um, the good thing for Romney is that there is precedent of those numbers being reversed in some cases. We mentioned I mentioned earlier Dukakis was. You know, if I gave this lecture in 1988, I'd be like, well, yeah, you know, Michael Dukakis was the next president, right? Uh, and he was very good favorability ratings. He had this whole Greek immigrant thing kind of working for him, um, and then he was kind of torn apart in the in the general election. And you know, one question political scientists asked was, was that because he was running an uphill fight because Reagan was popular, the economy was good, or did it really have to do more with the with the campaign? And you had Lee Atwater and so forth. You had, you know, the kind of well, there's no one clear point where the modern negative campaign began, but it was a well-run Republican campaign, and I think maybe Dukakis wasn't prepared for how much stuff he had hurled at him. But his 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 strong approval ratings or favorability ratings early on didn't really hold up through the rigors of a general election season. Uh, conversely, Bill Clinton actually had there were a lot of doubts about Bill Clinton at this stage in 1992. You had Jennifer Flowers. You had all this kind of personal personal stuff, and people like the ideas, but he didn't have a great reputation. We would not say, oh, Bill Clinton's going to overperform the fundamentals, overperform the economic numbers. Um, we wouldn't have said that in April 92. So it gets back to the question of how predictable things really are, and, and can, Romney, uh, can Romney somehow uh, at least get to average so he can win the elections when, um, when you know, the economy remains sluggish and, and so forth, and not, and not blow it for the Republican Party. I think, that, I think the jury's somewhat still out on that. If you look at Head-to-head -head polls, Obama against Romney. Obama's ahead by usually seven or eight points, which is a little bit wider than the spread in his approval ratings. But again, usually at this point, approval ratings are still going to be the more reliable indicator. It's a little bit of an abstract question, who, who you vote for in, in November. Whereas if you ask someone, well, what do you think of the job the president's doing right now, then um, the people tend to be a little bit more, more direct about that. Um, the other thing that could work for or against Obama, and Romney for that matter, is uh, is the economy. You know, the economy will not tell you with 100% certainty who's going to win, but it certainly tells you quite a bit. Um, when you have GDP growth historically that's negative, in a recession, um, it's been a long time since the incumbent party won in those circumstances. Although Truman actually in 1948 won when the economy was going through recession just that very November. So even there, there's an exception to every, to every rule potentially. Um, but, you know, when you have the big Landslides like '84 or, or '72 or Franklin or Roosevelt. That's when you have very very <coughs> clear economic headwinds for the or tailwinds for the for the incumbent party. When you have those big losses, it's when you have bad ones. This looks like in the middle range right now, where um, where it's going to be fought over, and both Obama and Bernie will be able to make uh, <coughs> persuasive and coherent arguments about where the economy is headed and how much how much uh, credit or blame should be apportioned. Um, Without a doubt, if you do have those jobs numbers and the GDP numbers and, and gas prices and everything else um, a little bit more favorable, then Obama would be more of a more of a favorite. And if those things turn against him, then he could be uh, less of one. Uh, you know, the other thing to remember when you're looking at any kind of economic numbers and projecting forward is that as maybe political forecasting isn't perfect, but economic forecasting is really pretty. Pretty awful. Um, in November, uh, in November 2007, uh, the survey of professional forecasters, which are a group of economists, same thing. If you look at the Wall Street Journal panel, thought GDP would grow by two and a half percent the next year, which is just slightly below 
below our average, average actually about what we thought it would grow at, or what's thought it would grow at this year. Um, it turned out the economy was actually already in recession, actually in December of 07. So they didn't even, not did they not only predict a recession, they didn't know they were in one at the time. And they had assigned only about a one in 2,000 chance in the survey to actually <coughs> specify how much confidence they have in their forecast. Only about a one in 2,000 chance to the actual magnitude of the crisis that we, that we really had. Um, economists have no historic ability, if you look at these surveys, to predict recessions more than six months out. Sometimes they'll predict recessions, of course, that don't actually occur. Um, so even though we're getting more into the election, you know, there's still a lot we don't know about how the economy will, will unfold. There is a more bullish case to be made now about the consumer getting back on board. And there's also a, a bearish one where you have a lot of long-term problems. Um, you have also these somewhat asymmetric risks with respect to, to Europe. Certainly, it seems like it's gotten its house a little bit more in order, but it's a lot of, it's kind of a lot of Band-Aid solutions that could break open at any time, and that could get pretty ugly, potentially. Um, and certainly the Middle East, you know, I, I do advise people to look at a broad array of economic indicators. There's nothing special about gas prices per se, but if you did have, you know, oil cut off in, in Iran, um, you have various scenarios where it could go to five or six dollars a barrel, or excuse me, yeah, yeah, gas could go to five or six dollars per gallon, and that could, you know, would not be what I think President Obama would want in an election year. Um, at the same time, you would have a military confrontation probably associated with that event, and that could spin out and play out in different ways. He doesn't have the typical democratic weakness of, of appearing weak on, on foreign policy, probably killing Osama bin Laden, um, gets him some immunity that, from that potentially. Um, so, uh, so we'll see. I mean, if you, for the, for the last few months, uh, I've really thought that it's about, Obama's about a 60 40 favorite. Ever since you had this period in January where you got that, excuse me, it was February, you, had, you got the very favorable jobs report, his approval ratings ticked up by about 4%, going from 44% to, to 48%. You go from just a little bit below where you need to be to at or above. Um, you know, you think he's about a 60 40 favorite. And maybe you would downweight that a little bit because there's still, we're still projecting pretty mediocre economic performance the rest of the year, but you know, I think the balance of the evidence would weigh against, against Romney being a super great candidate, and you can make a case for why he's a pretty mediocre candidate. He's not going to be an incompetent candidate. I mean, his campaign's pretty smart. He'll raise a lot of money. Uh, he's pretty good at, at debating, so he's not going to make huge mistakes. I know he, make, he makes some gaffes, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's not terrific for him, but more, it's that I think it's the constraint of the Republican Party. You know, will he... Uh, do what might would be maybe to maybe mistake, but if you if for example you put like Paul Ryan on his ticket, I think the Obama White House would love to have someone from the House of Representatives on their Republican ticket. Um, we know that however popular Obama is or isn't, the Congress is a 10% approval rating, and so um, you know it's it's tough. I mean, Romney probably is going to want someone who's uh, who's conservative. There are still people in the base who have concerns about Romney. At the same time, you want someone who will show you a more nuanced side, maybe the Republican Party, potentially. Uh, he's going to want someone who's experienced, uh, but you know, you don't want someone who seems like too much of an insider, necessarily. Um, picking a VP is tough, although really, you know, Obama, or Romney's list isn't bad. The Republicans seem to have a better kind of class of 2016 than they have, than they have this year. You can start to pick off from that class, potentially. Now, part of this is cyclical, by the way, where uh, because Republicans got blown out in a lot of elections in 2006 and 2008, um, then that deprived them of people who would be kind of coming into their prime now. It's like having a bad, a bad draft in baseball, where that you know that can catch up with you three years later sometimes, <coughs> but not immediately. Um, and likewise, usually you have at least one current or former nominee that's available, but because uh, because they picked some vice presidential nominees who either didn't really want to run for president, like Dick Cheney or like Sarah Palin, probably couldn't win if they if they tried. Um, that limits their options a little bit. And a lot of times you have the vice president or the nominee from the past cycle running again, um, where you have someone who was who's kind of next in line. You can kind of make that argument for for Romney, by the way, that he was he was next in line, and that prediction I guess looked good this year. Um, but anyway, why don't we open up to, to questions? Um, and we just kind of talk, you guys want to reflect more on the primary, you want to talk about <laughs> House and Senate, or just kind of general stuff, or baseball, I, I'm, we'll keep it pretty, pretty open-ended here. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I got a question about gender politics and how you've seen that both historically, where it's at now, where do you think it might be going? So, what do you mean in terms of the the gender gap in the in the presidential vote? Yeah, and and, and uh, you know where they tend to vote, maybe even age groups uh, with, you know, within uh, uh, women voters and how, where they're where they're going and what that might imply in this election cycle. Well, people, you know, people. When people talk about Obama's base in, in 2008, people would think, oh, you have the African-American vote, African American vote, you have the, the youth vote, right? But, um, but you know, baby boomer generation women are a huge core part <laughs> of the Democratic base. And they often have, you know, they're often more politically engaged and on a more consistent basis than Democrats or, or excuse me, than, than, you know, younger voters are, for instance. And so, you know, uh, people were, there was a lot of discussion, I guess, uh, you know, a year ago or so about will Obama be able to motivate the Democratic base, and I'm not sure he'll have youth turnout for instance that's as high as it was in 2008. But if you look at women over the age of, of 50, um, you know, that's what I think has been motivated and locked into the Obama coalition because of some of the, the reproduction debates and, and gender debates and so forth within the Republican, within the Republican Party primary. I mean, that's a case where, um, you know, Romney's extricated himself from the primary right now, but you know there probably there probably was at least some damage done around the margin. Historically, by the way, when a party has a more difficult primary process, is measured by how much of the of the vote. Romney, for example, has won about forty percent of the popular vote in the primary so far. Um, historically, candidates who have that track record haven't done very well. Even though even Obama got forty eight percent, forget is that McCain only got forty forty five percent or so of the Republican vote. In a way, it just came really fast because the way the calendar um, occurred. But when you don't have, when you have a, a president who is not challenged for for uh, uh, for the nomination, and you have a contentious nomination in the other party, then there's a pretty bad track record for the opposition party uh, historically. And one reason might be because, yeah, the, you know, Obama doesn't have to take any controversial positions for a whole three or four months period, <coughs> whereas whereas Romney did. And Romney did tend to make these choices, which I think. You know, if he loses the election by one point, he might regret. To, he did tend to to push to the right, not try and not try and modulate his stance on issues, and less so on the gender stuff around me. But you know, on the immigration issue, for instance, that's something where maybe be a little bit harder now for him to drive um, Hispanic support than it might be otherwise. But uh, but yeah, I mean, that's you know, that's the big question: is how much does this uh, do the non-economic issues matter? These kind of these kind of uh, uh, issues that traditionally you thought that's what Republicans want to talk about, right? All these wedge issues, right? Or like what the GOP does to kind of um, to to score points against the Democrats' inherent advantage on the economy. Now it's almost like kind of the reverse for like a lot of the wedge issues. You know, even like even like like gay marriage now or something is an issue where it's not really a reliable GOP wedge issue anymore. Look at the polling; it's pretty much 50-50, and it's it's moving a couple points every year. So by November, even though the populace that turns out to vote it's a little bit older, it might be. Um, more on the opposition side, um, it's not going to really be a driver for for the GOP. Um, but uh, anyway, so I, the gender stuff for me is the whole big constellation of, <laughs> of things about uh, about where the Republican Party, Democratic Party are moving, um, and the fact that before it was more economic policy, and now you have the social stuff tied into it, makes Obama have a more robust attack against so these guys are, are trying to take away your reproductive rights and, and so forth. Yeah. Um, where was Santorum polling in Pennsylvania? With Romney? Yeah. So they were about tied actually in, in Pennsylvania. Um, I, I, I think he made the calculation, I don't know, I think he made the calculation that uh, there's not a lot of upside <laughs> really. I mean, if he had won, he needed to win Illinois and Wisconsin, not, not lose both. I mean, he lost almost every delegate in the voting in Illinois. And, in Maryland and DC. Um, so he made, I think, in some ways the correct analysis. Uh, but he, you know, he could have won Pennsylvania and then, and then <coughs> what happens, well, there are a bunch of favorable states for him in, in May. Um, but you know, one thing I think was a little different this year was that you know, people, I think, recognized earlier that it was pretty much over the delegate <laughs> count. I mean, Ronnie was ahead two, two and a half to to one, um, and so you didn't have this campaign like you had in, like in 1992, for example, you had Bill Clinton, <coughs> and you had Jerry Brown, who generated a lot of news, even though Bill Clinton had a pretty securely 
in the delegate count. Um, Santorum wasn't able to do that. He wasn't able to make the race interesting enough for for the news media, frankly, and for and for voters. So you know, where I realized that Santorum was in trouble, and I, I was not one of those people who predicted at the very start, by the way, that oh, you know, Romney's for sure going to win. I was the favorite, but I thought you had legitimate stuff going on in, in some of the early states. Um, but when you saw people becoming disinterested in the race and resigned to Romney, that's where it made it it made it tough because he was already behind Santorum, which meant that he had to overperform how he had done in previous states. Um, and if you start to have the tide flow against you, because there are certain some voters just say, "Well, I don't really love Romney, but this is I'm sick of this campaign. <laughs> Let's get it over with." Then uh, then you kind of had the plug pulled on him, and just the little further stuff that you took in the polls. Where Wisconsin, for example, is a state that. You know, I had thought Santorum might have won if you looked at kind of where the distributions were in, in Ohio <coughs> and so forth. And, and Minnesota is a state that went for Santorum by, by 20 points. So Wisconsin was really a sign that it's, <laughs> it's over. I think he made a correct analysis. I'm not sure he'll get very much out of it. I'm not sure if he's got that much of a political future. I think he might wind up getting, um, getting lapped by some of these kind of, you know, people in the Rubio, Chris Christie crowd in 2016, if there is a 2016 nomination for the GOP. Um, but, you know, I don't think he wanted to go, and if he lost Pennsylvania, it'd be really embarrassing. If he won it, he would still have a 1 in 100 chance of winning the nomination or something. So he made that calculation accordingly, I think. Yeah? You had mentioned the low, the low popularity of Congress. How does that really play into the election, given that there's likely to be no one from Congress running, like Clinton did previously, using them as the case? I mean, historic, I mean, the elections for Congress are in some ways tougher to figure out than the, than the presidency. Um, historically, when you have lower approval ratings for Congress, it does translate into more incumbents being thrown out of office. And so you could, you know, people always talk about, oh, you have the anti-incumbent wave election, which is kind of not really occurred that often historically, but you could have people in both parties losing a lot of seats, of course. Democrats control the Senate and have a lot of incumbents up, so that makes it challenging for them. The GP controls. The House, they're helped a little bit by redistricting, um, but uh, you know, I, I, it's it's it'll be interesting to see. Senate and House campaigns often click in later than presidential campaigns do in terms of really reading the mood of the electorate. But you know, I would love to be an incumbent or a non-incumbent running against an incumbent this year. Um, every a lot of these questions in terms of you know who do you uh, you know do you want to be like a member of Congress are as low as they ever been really. What's less clear is will that translate into a big partisan advantage for the Democrats in the House say. Um, you know, ironically it may actually uh, it may actually help the GOP Congress, the GOP House candidates a little bit if the economy does improve. Kind of what happened in, in 96 is that you had an improving economy and voters said, okay, well we're not gonna go for Bob Dole, but you know, it's, we don't want to give Democrats unilateral power either after just pulling them out, and so you know, kind of both sides benefited from the improving conditions that year. And you also had the Congress undermining Dole in, in some ways, right, and trying to make uh, make themselves look more popular by partisan with with Clinton. And it kind of it kind of worked. I mean, people for people talk about oh how the GOP blew their chance after '94, but they um, they do it. You know, they were charging Congress for for 12 years and some really tough cycles like 96 for the party and so, you know, um, they began to act in, in self-interested ways. I'm not sure how to happen with the current crop Republican leaders if you're not gonna have any kind of kumbaya moments with, with Obama later this year. Um, but, you know, you will have to see if, 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 if it looks like they have an easier road than, than Romney does say, then you can start to see some dynamics where, where Romney gets cut off or, or vice versa, where Romney starts running against the Congress later in the year. But you know, the fact that people hate everyone so much will make things, I think, will make things interesting <laughs> as compared to, to normal. Yeah, in the brief. Um, to follow up on that question a little bit, what, what are your, what's your sense about um, ticket, ticket splitting or the trends in ticket splitting and the trends in coattails? I'm just wondering that if, if Karl Rove's basic insight from 2004 is right, that the, what, what you have to do is you have to turn out the base you end up filling all of the offices by whoever gets their base out to yeah. the greatest extent. And, that, and that's correct. The, the, the long-term trend is toward less uh, ticket splitting in, in almost all races, whether it's you know, governor and, uh, and house and senate seats. Um, you, know, you do probably have the number of, of 
Well, I, I don't know. But people who are, the number of independents is increasing, so the number of Democrats and Republicans that share electorate is slightly decreasing a little bit. Although a lot of independents kind of say they're independent and then behave like regular, like regular partisans, potentially. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, right now you don't have a lot of people in either party, especially with the party who are running against their party. And so, you know, it does seem like, uh, it does seem like the Republicans' risks are not all that well hedged, potentially. Um, you know, conditional upon Obama winning re-election, then um, it's not so sure that uh, you'll have a Republican House, for example. Uh, I think it'll be very hard. I don't think you'll have a full, like, double flip where you have a, a GOP or, or Democratic House and, and Romney in charge. Um, but uh, but I know. I mean, because, because there's so much party discipline in the GOP that's a big driving <laughs> driving force and you know my view is that at some point um, at some point it's going to catch up with them uh, but it might not be might not be this year necessarily it's like the stock market where something's in a in a in a bubble right you can maybe tell it in advance but you maybe you don't but you know it's really only 10 or 20 years that, <laughs> that things return to the equilibrium uh, I mean just the fact that we've had uh, gone through every different permutation of having a, a first a Republican a president and Republican Congress, and then a <laughs> Republican president and Democratic Congress, then Democrat and Democrat, and now Democrat and Republican. The four basic combinations have all occurred in the last four election cycles. It's also the case that sometimes you go uh, for a couple of decades where you have a lot of volatility, and the volatility is associated with partisanship and tends to, to reinforce partisanship. And so, um, you know, the kind of stable period we had politically from, say, 1952, really, you know, from 1948 to 1988, which is where, by the way, a lot of these election models work really well, where things are kind of smooth and stable. Maybe that's, maybe that was abnormal, you know, just like the, the long, steady growth we had during, <laughs> during that period was, was abnormal historically, and we'll return to a more kind of tumultuous political universe for, for some time to come. Yeah. Okay. Um, the media talks a lot about what, which candidate will be better able to attract independent voters over the next few months. Mm -hmm. Do you expect this campaign to come down more to who attracts independence or who is able to get more of their core base to show up? I think it's kind of, you know, both are important. I'm not sure that there's one that's more important particularly. Uh, the, the number of swing voters is gradually in decline, I think. Um, it's, you know, it's more indispensable for, for Romney to win independence because uh, there still are some more Democrats in the country. They have like a 6% advantage in terms of overall party identification. And Democrats are still pretty loyal to President Obama. So if Obama turns his base out, I mean, it's hard to turn the Republican or the Democratic base out than the, than the GOP when you have more different constituencies in the, in the Democratic Party, right? So it's hard to do that. But for him, yes, a base mobilization strategy um, <coughs> might suffice to win re-election if he wins, if he kind of holds his own with, it, with independence, whereas Romney more or less has to win them. Um, but, you know, but Romney could could, uh, could also have a, if, if Democrats were unenthusiastic and the GOP really liked him, then you could have a, a Bush-type victory. But it seems almost more likely we'll have, you know, Obama is almost more in the, in the 04 Bush role, right? Um, in, in a lot of ways, that campaign resembles this one. You have a, a Massachusetts... <laughs> Candidate running against a, a you know medium popularity kind of uh, one term incumbent, uh, and so I you know I think the Obama people will run a pretty nasty campaign, and I think they'll they'll be very good at, at motivating the Democratic base in different ways. One hidden advantage they might have is that they did a very good job with um, with voter mobilization in 2008. So apart from the fact, well, okay, well the voters might not be enthusiastic, but they have very good data and they really know who they want to target and in which states and in which counties in those states. The McCain campaign made, made no real effort at all to build up its voter database, nothing on turnout, and that's something which might cause some inherited problems for, for Romney four years later, where you're missing a bunch of data and information that the Obama campaign has, and that could hurt, hurt it a little bit. Yeah. I was wondering what kind of influence uh, the potential of the social movement have on an election. Uh, what kind of uh, influence the potential of the social movement can have on an election, such as a so, uh, any social movement, such as the, in particular, like the Occupy movement, have on an election? Yeah, I think if you look at uh, if you look at media coverage of of 
for example, how often the terms inequality were used in major American newspapers. There was a big shift, actually, uh, around Occupy Wall Street. And if you control for the mentions of Occupy Wall Street itself, then, um, then, it, uh, then it's still pretty significant. Where all of a sudden, if you look at Google searches, for example, the term inequality had increased by three or fourfold. You can tie very clearly to Occupy Wall Street. So I think it changed the, the conversation a little bit and exerts a lot of indirect influence on on the way the election might unfold. Um, I also think, though, that uh, that it's you know it's not going to like the people who organize the protests are, are not by and large loyal partisan Democrats. They tend to see both parties as as part of the issue. Um, you know, a lot of them are independents. So that you know, they're actually kind of they almost like swing voters, right? They're mostly like white independents as the typical like Occupy Wall Street participant, although much younger than. Uh, than the kind of population median. Um, but so I think it's not going to become a new coalition within the Democrat Party so much as a, a, a outside liberal group that is looking more toward the long term in terms of how it influences policy. And in some ways, it's probably good for, for the left uh, to have groups like that. You, 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 it's not healthy, uh, I think, for democracy to have everything co opted in a political party, potentially. And, you know, in some ways, the Tea Party. Is kind of that, and in some ways maybe they aren't quite as much. But um, but you know, Occupy is I think different than the Tea Party in terms of being less uh, focused on on near term political objectives and more about how it would change the the discourse. It's an interesting force, but I'm not sure if it uh, will have as many direct effects on on this year's election. Yeah. Uh, if the um, Supreme Court comes back and says that the um, Obama's health care bill is unconstitutional. How do you think that would affect his campaign or his chances? Uh, I don't think you want one of your signature accomplishments being declared unconstitutional at any point <laughs> when you're running for president. Um, I, I do think the fact that uh, the ruling would be in June and that, and that Romney can't really talk a lot about about health care. He can't get that far on the issue. So it's, it's, it's a minor negative for Obama. Um, but yeah, definitely not something uh, he'd be happy with. I don't buy these arguments that, oh, it'll motivate Democrats. I mean, I, you know, Democrats are not going to have that much trouble getting motivated. And the, and the average voter, the average independent voter, still thinks that doesn't like the health care bill particularly. And if you highlight that and maybe give Romney kind of an out to say, well, the Supreme Court said this and that. Um, but I think because it is Romney, um, and because he was the father of, of this bill, basically, um, he can only get so much mileage out of it worse that we're Rick Perry is going to have a ton of other problems, um, but you know Rick Perry might be able to talk about about the healthcare bill more. Yeah, could you go into a little more detail about your sixty to forty guesstimate, and in particular, is that a forecasting model with tweaks, or is it intuition? No, it's it's you know common. I mean, if you look at if you have a basic model where you look at um, we have a model at the New York Times that I did in the magazine, which just looks at GDP. Or projected GDP, right? Plus, uh, plus approval ratings, plus um, the ideology of opposition candidate. Romney qualifies as being neither a moderate nor a conservative, just kind of basically generic Republican, right? And you get to about 60% there. If you look at approval ratings, approval ratings alone, you know, Obama's maybe just at 48, 49%, a little bit above the historical break even point. So 60%. If you look at betting markets, that's about what you get. I mean, I, I haven't really done my big general election model yet, and maybe if I look at a few more things, like the states a little bit more, there might be some more advantage where it's more two to one Obama or more more a toss up. I think I think somewhere in that range is is the range of acceptable answers. I think if you if you gave me an answer that you thought, oh, Romney's a favorite, I think that's, you know, a little dubious we'd have a conversation about that. If you told me that Obama's more than about a two to one favorite, I think it's also, you know, not really justified based on based on the evidence. So do you take the prediction markets as an affirmation? Uh, could you talk a little more generally about that kind of crowd wisdom? Uh, you know, I think whenever you make, when you make a model of something like presidential election where you have just 16 data points, basically 16 elections since World War II, um, you have a lot of choices to make as, <laughs> as a forecaster, right? And so I think you need, if, you're, if you deviate radically from what other people are doing, what the markets are doing, then I think you have to you have to be pretty sure of yourself and make sure you're not just making a choice that, that fits what you want to happen in the election or that's going to, uh, I don't know, you have to think things through carefully and you can, uh, if you formulate a model that you have Obama as a, as a five to one favorite, I think that's probably 
a poorly specified model. So I think it's a good candidate sanity check. I think you know conventional wisdom is sometimes a good departure point. It doesn't always mean that these betting markets are always smart. I mean, there were times when they did like blatantly stupid things during the GOP primary campaign where you had you know Mitt Romney as a 97 percent favorite to win Colorado, which you know. Of course, Romney, I thought Romney was going to win Colorado, but they didn't really have very well calibrated estimates of, of the probabilities. We have very little information about that. And even after Santorum won Minnesota and so forth, and I said, I'm like, mm, this doesn't look so good for, for Romney, right? And so they weren't, I don't think they're all that sophisticated, but in terms of the, the for a good benchmark for what conventional wisdom holds, I put, like, I put it like this. I don't have a good reason to depart from kind of the slightly elevated conventional wisdom that, that Obama's a slight a slight favor. There's nothing magical I see in any number, any set of numbers that would suggest that um, that Romney can't win, or that or that Romney's somehow um, the favorite, despite being behind in the polls and despite Obama uh, kind of being at his benchmarks for approval rating and so forth. <coughs> yeah, in the back. Um, I'm kind of wondering, uh, sort of based on the Supreme Court thing. Supposing it were coming later in the year and you had to develop your model before that were to come out, but it would come out before election day. Yeah. How much weight would you sort of give that in your statistical model? Well, we're not really, so my model is basically just based on, the model I should publish is based mostly on polls, probably a very soft economic component. Um, and so, I, you know, I think it's, uh, it's tricky to break things down and, and say, okay, here's, <laughs> here's what the fundamentals are. I mean, one thing I was going to do this presentation, but if you look at uh, the models that claim what they have are fundamental factors, there are actually like 38 different variables they use with, which they claim are fundamental, some of which are very, uh, very elaborate. Like, you know, New Hampshire primary vote for opposition party candidate cap between 30 and 7 percent of the vote, right? You have these very particularly specified variables that are kind of meant to capture noise and past data and make a model look smart, um, but don't really have any, any predictive power out of, out of sample. And so, you know, the good thing about a poll is that you're not making any, any presumptions. I mean, in some ways, if you have a model that says, well, uh, say Obama's ahead in the polls, but Romney's going to win because of the economy, in some ways, you're being very presumptuous to say that, uh, you know, I know better than the voters right now what they're going <laughs> to what they're going to do and, and how they're going to decide. Um, and when you only have a limited amount of data from past elections, I think sometimes those presumptions don't really don't really hold up very well. Um, but you know, I, you know, I, I think uh, in general, presidential elections are about big picture issues, and I'm not quite sure where where Obamacare um, falls in the divide of being a big issue versus being kind of a a side issue. I think it might seem like old news though to voters by um, by November, where healthcare was pretty clearly a big factor, Democrats' losses in 2010. Um, I think people have made up their minds about it already, and so I'm not sure it'll be that much of a game changer. But I think you know, it's 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 to Obama's downside if you if you have the risks. I think, and that there's not going to be some um, some massive boomerang that will help him. I think if it's if it's if it's if it's axed, I guess it could help him if it's if it's upheld, you know, in part, and that would that would deprive. Uh, Romney of some oxygen. I mean, people might also want to consider that we could have a really messy outcome of the Supreme Court. Where they strike parts of the bill and not and not other parts, or they could punt on it potentially, um, find some excuse not to have to adjudicate it. Um, so they're really like four or five different scenarios, and it'll get interesting. But I think it's going to be in the second tier of issues, not the not the first tier by November. I mean, how if you look at the role of the super PACs in the general election, does it change sort of the way you're looking at that election, or does it just feed in to your view that it will be a very negative campaign of exits? Yeah, it's, it's uh, the super PACs are another big, <laughs> big, you know, unknown or known unknown, I should say. Uh, you know, we also don't have a lot of evidence on how they behave exactly. like. Do people have guesses about how much super PAC spending will be in the general election? I'm just curious, like people think, like 300 million, a billion, right? Um, but remember, Obama has his super PACs also. In 2010, um, when we did have super PACs, it went about 55, 56% of the money went to GOP candidates and 43, 44% went to Democrats. And so it's not necessarily as lopsided as people assume. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, that could that could definitely change things 
quite a bit. Uh, it could also make it harder for a candidate to stay on a message, potentially. I mean, I'm not sure that, that Newt's super PAC really necessarily helped them in in the end. It kind of gave you a quick hit. By the way, when, when the but discovery really changed the primary dynamic. I mean, it, yeah, yeah. Santorum and Newt are still out there. <coughs> I'm so. not. No. I think that, well, okay. No, I guess, I guess you're right. I think advertising definitely played a huge role in in Florida, right? And probably in, in Iowa. I'm not sure during the home stretch it made as much as much difference. I mean Romney Romney's ad buys with the super PAC were still smaller than often the Democrats were in two thousand eight just by the campaigns themselves. But no, yeah, you're right. I mean, I mean Florida was such a pivotal moment yeah. and for Romney to be able to drop uh, basically a fifteen million super PAC spend in Florida, um, plus whatever he spent from his own campaign, which might have been another Eight million. Of course, a big state. You gotta be willing to spend, you know, that kind of money to have an influence. But they really, uh, they really took themselves out of very mortal danger in that state in, in a hurry. And they also had a lot of help, though, that uh, they were running against candidates like Gingrich that had a lot of vulnerabilities and had some, some bad debates. Why well, you could wish you could have a natural experiment, right? Where you could right. <laughs> what exactly. happened with, without the super PACs, and we never, we never will quite know. Uh, but you know, I would say in general, in a primary. Uh, advertising probably matters more than in a general election booth because it can be more more lopsided because you have more swing voters. People aren't. It's not where eighty percent people know who they're going to decide for right now. When you have a lot of people who are up in the air between the candidates, you also have uncertain turnout. So, um, so that's where you might think they might have the most influence. But you know, but there's no doubt that I think everything is going to be, <laughs> you know, every nasty line of attack um, we're going to see, and frankly, probably from. From both sides, and uh, it helps. You know, Romney actually hasn't raised all that much money through his campaign himself, but it, it protects against protects against um, having any kind of financial difficulties, or protects him from having to tap into his own pocket potentially. I think the one thing um, he needs to be careful of is that uh, is that it doesn't become too much of an air war, and you don't have the ground operation and the turnout stuff and the voter databases. Um, you know, that was kind of Rick Perry's mistake, among many other mistakes that Rick Perry <laughs> made. Um, but you know, they were really trying to fight, to fight an air war in, in Iowa. Um, for instance, they spent as much money as anyone on ads in Iowa. They never improved upon 10% of the polls because they weren't well organized like the Santorum campaign was. You saw McCain make a mistake in 2008 um, to the candidate who had better get out the vote efforts, Bush in oh, 2002 four do pretty well, and so you know you would hope that Romney people wouldn't forget about that component of it, and just kind of <coughs> take the attention and blast Obama over the airwaves. Just one or two more questions. Yeah. Uh, so now that Romney is the candidate, so what, what, are, what do you see as the key states in the election to watch? It's a, you know it's a pretty good bet. They'll be the same ones they were as they were four years ago, for the most part. Um, I think you know if you want if, if you look at. Uh, Virginia and, and Colorado. Actually, one thing I think is we'll be interesting to see is, do you have more of a 2008 style map where Virginia and Colorado are key, or is it more of a 2000-2004 style map where it's Ohio and Florida and Pennsylvania? Um, one downside case for Romney is that if he's unperforming among, among working class voters, especially working class whites because of the whole class stuff, then it becomes very difficult to win the, the Midwest. So, you know, I think the Obama campaign's most robust strategy is just uh, saturate the Midwest, right, and then run a Midwest-oriented campaign when you don't really need to win Colorado and, and Virginia, where you have a lot of higher income voters groups that, in theory, might, might like Romney a little bit more. Um, but one else we did found that actually, um, you know, if Obama could trade lower income white voters for higher income white voters. It's a good trade on the electoral map because it does help you a lot in the Midwest. You can sacrifice the trendy new states like Colorado and so forth um, to make sure you win Lockdown, Michigan and, and Ohio, Pennsylvania and so forth. If you, if you win those states as Democrat, then you can win the election kind of there alone. Yeah. Um, Obama so it sounds like foreign policy is going to be a strength for the Obama administration, but to what extent do you think his Middle East foreign policy regarding Iran particularly will be a determinant factor in, in, in his you know, I think, well, we'll have to see what, what happens in that part of the world for the next 
eight months. Um, you know, I tend to think the the uh, the discussion about oh, Obama has been been soft on the Brown. I think that's more something which motivates Republican base and not necessarily an issue that's going to that, that's going to change a lot of of swing voters' minds necessarily. Um, but you know, I mean, there's a fairly high. In some ways, it's been surprising actually. If, if after uh, after what happened in Egypt and so forth last year, um, it's surprising you haven't had uh, you haven't had anything break out uh, uh, more broadly in the in the region potentially. <coughs> you know, I think Middle East policy is one of those things that really motivates both bases a lot. And unless America groups are getting involved or in breaking interest are directly involved, meaning things like energy prices, I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be a, a, a key issue with, with swing voters. One last question. Yeah. Um, who do you think uh, on the Democratic side will run in 2016? In 2016, um, well, I think you have kind of yeah. a, a backing order where if Hillary Clinton wants to be the nominee, she. Well, she announced that she wasn't the nominee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's not. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, John Huntsman, after after finishing third in New Hampshire, to take it to Rye to, to the rest of the primaries. Uh, you know, I I think I'm not sure why Hillary wouldn't want to run, um, where she kind of got better as a candidate over the course of of, um, of the campaign. Right? Uh, she has high approval ratings. She has a Secretary of State credential now, which is pretty unimpeachable. Right? She would still be a barrier breaking. Candidate, um, I'm not sure why she wouldn't want to run, right? She did a lot of things right in 2008, and now she's, she's smart enough to know the things she did wrong. Um, so if she ran, the question I think is almost would it clear the field, uh, sort of as as Bush did in 2000, and she would have maybe an easy time winning the nomination. And she could also, run, by the way, win or lose for for Obama. I think her prospects work equally well in either in either case. Um, you know, if not her, you would think that. Andrew Cuomo is someone who is is maybe well positioned. I think he might be someone that kind of runs as more of the more than moderate. You could have Cuomo against Elizabeth Warren potentially. Um, Joe Biden is someone who um, you know he's the vice president, and if Obama has a good second term, uh, I mean, well, not good objectively, but you know, if he's, if he's popular after a second term, um, then you know Biden might want to get in the race. And their people seem to be very conscious when you're getting more. Cuomo buzz and Hillary buzz to make sure, hey, Biden's, you know, he could run, he could run too, but you know, you kind of, you do, I think, have, have Hillary and and everyone else. I think the Democrats are not, they're not lacking for, for strong candidates, um, but uh, but we'll see. It's it's interesting, and you could you could maybe have, you, know, you could have interparty skirmishes there. I don't think you'll have, I don't think you'll have like a Martin Warner centrist type. I think you'll probably have someone who's basically. Uh, not to the right of, of Cuomo, for instance, um, but 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 we'll see. We'll have time for everyone else to sort of ask questions they had. There's a little bit of food left, so you're welcome to hang around, Mr. Silver, for a little bit longer. Let's give a round of applause.